Good day everyone and welcome to day 259, turn 259 of your daily Civ 7 news update. I'm going to recap some of the main bits of news from the Shawnee live stream that took place this morning. Uh, right off the bat I'm going to talk about this loading screen. This is the screen you'll get when you're loading into the game as Tecumseh. And I'm going to say it, Firaxis, I am begging you, make this the screen you see when you're interacting with the leaders. This artwork is incredible. It's immersive, and it really makes you feel like you've travelled to go and meet with this leader in their lands, and you're having some kind of epic negotiation. They've mentioned it on a bunch of live streams now. They're really proud of how the leaders interact in the current iteration with both of them on the screen at the same time. That's fine. I disagree. I don't expect this to make it into the base game at this point, but I would not be surprised at all if this gets changed further down the line. Nothing wrong with admitting that it just wasn't meant to be and changing it to what I would consider to be the obviously superior choice, but at the end of the day, that's just my opinion. This livestream, Fraxis was accompanied by two members of the Shawnee tribe, and I thought they were great personalities. Uh, also long-time Civ players too, which meant they were uh, really able to talk the same language as he put it in terms of implementing Tecumseh and the Shawnee into the game, which was really cool. They showed some awesome concept art and talked a bit about how civs in this game will each put their own design spin on buildings. Pictured here is the Shawnee University, for example, and this concept will also be applied to units as well. So here are some Shawnee Knights. No longer the western silver plate armor style of knight for everyone, we all get our own unique look. Now my number one question after seeing this, for both units and buildings, is how far are they going to stretch this concept? Because this seems like an absolutely enormous undertaking. If every Civ essentially has their own unique version of every unit and building in the game, it's no wonder that this game spent this long in development because that is ridiculous. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I don't foresee there being a unique Shawnee spin on the Stealth Bomber, for example. Could be wrong, um, but I'm just wondering where the line is. So. For what it's worth, I for one would love to see them give Australia a unique monument and just make it the big banana, because if that's not worthy of posture culture per turn, I don't know what is. The other major talking point for the live stream was the devs showing off the advanced start. So this is where you start in the Age of Exploration, for example. This appears to work pretty similarly to previous games, except with a lot more choice, which I think is genius. Now who knows if these numbers are final, obviously, but you can see the start with your capital here. At a whopping 20 population, and for the exploration age you're given 7 legacy points to work with. So these each grant different effects, you can see it costs, costs 2 to gain a city, 1 for a town, uh, and you basically just get to kind of start your empire off how you want. So you just click, and it instantly places stuff exactly where you want it to go, um, and you're off. So a nice touch here too is that if you do want to use some of these bonuses to settle further away, you can choose not to place a town instantly, for example, and you just receive these settlers as units and then you can do with them as you please. It's such a well thought out system, particularly considering this is for a, a very very small subset of players that typically choose not to start from the first stage in Civ games. If we look at the global achievements in Civ 6, we can see only 0.9% of players on Steam have won a game from an Atomic Era start, and the numbers aren't too much higher for the other eras either. But noting that games in Civ 7 are meant to be much longer, with each age almost meant to feel like a full game, I can see where they're putting in a, a bit more thought into these advanced starts, that's really cool. Uh, the last bit of news I've got is a dev diary by Dennis, great alliteration there. Dennis Shirk, an executive producer at Firaxis, wrote quite a detailed article here about their rationale behind choosing civs and leaders, so go give it a read. Particularly I found interesting the part about the new mix and match system and why they went down this path to be really cool. Uh, I agree that this will for sure open lots of doors in terms of re replayability, and it's no doubt allows for hundreds if not thousands of combinations of civs and leaders over the game. My main uh, concern is still that it doesn't close the door on super unique abilities like Coupe starting in the ocean, or Babylon instantly unlocking technologies with Eurekas. These abilities require such a tightly designed set of restrictions on them to make them work. I hope the devs can find a way to still include abilities that go beyond simple stat bonuses. That's all I've got for you today. There's a lot of good stuff revealed over the past 24 hours. I'll see you all tomorrow, but until then, thanks for watching.